is something that was kind of a teaching that I came across, well, it's over 10 years ago now. And, um, and I think it brings a lot of meaning to this, uh, what I call the mountaintop experience on what we generally refer to as the, the mountain of God or Mount Sinai because it's in the Sinai Desert. We still don't know for sure which mountain that is. I have a different opinion than what a lot of the scholars do, but, and we have tradition that says it's in the Sinai Peninsula, and, uh, but I think there's references in scripture that talk about the mountain of God truly being Mount Horeb uh, in, in Midian, in, in Arabia, uh, both with, uh, with Elijah and, uh, and a reference here with Moses as well in, in Exodus chapter 3 at the burning bush. So anyway, we'll, uh, we'll tackle this. Hope you, hope you find it interesting because it kind of makes a comparison to what was happening on the mountain that God called Moses to take his people to. And, and as we talked about last week, Moses had to climb that mountain, we believe, four times at least, mentioned, two times, I think Raymond mentioned in his message last week, two times he spent 40 days uh, up there uh, fasting. And, uh, but the other two times was kind of up and down. To, to get instruction to the people and then to return to God. So that's kind of the background for this, but uh, this, is, uh, this is a teaching that I want to share in some of the Hebrew, the Hebrew pictures of the Hebrew language and the, some of the words that are used uh, to describe parts of the Hebrew wedding. And so I believe God intended, his intention was to marry Israel on the mountain of God. And, uh, and he called Moses to be the leader who would bring, bring the message to them. And so we, we generally think of Mount Sinai as uh, the mountain where the law was given. But I think hopefully you'll come away today, maybe, or studying it further yourself, that the law that we usually, most people look at as uh, rules or do's and don'ts, if you will, but I think it's a whole different picture that when you look at it from a, a marriage standpoint. And you know, God did marry Israel. So I've got this chart here that you can look at, make a copy of if you have a phone that can take a picture. Um, I've got the places in the Old Testament scripture that picture that relationship between God as husband and wife. Uh, and, and God in this case is Yahweh, the Lord, um, which we usually associate more directly with the Father. But we also know we are to have a relationship with part with the Son of the Trinity, the three persons of the Trinity, and so we are the bride of Christ. And so I've also got the, the verses in the New Testament that seem to point to that picture, particularly in Ephesians 5. So anyway, we'll, we'll leave it at that for now, and I'll, I'll get into this teaching, but let's begin, as we always do, with a word of prayer, and then we'll turn to chapter 19 of, of Exodus and reread some of what we read last week and then go on from there. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, this beautiful morning as we near the season of fall, and we thank you for the, the coolness in the air, even though we know we still have some hotter temperatures yet to experience, and we even appreciate that because we know that uh, once fall comes, we know that winter isn't necessarily too far behind. And so we, we thank you for the season. We thank you for the beauty of the season that you bring. We thank you for the provision. We continue to pray for rain, Lord, and we thank you for the rains that have come, but we, we uh, can still use more in our part of the country. But uh, 
I just ask you by the power of your Holy Spirit to lead my teaching this morning, that it be <clears throat> true to your word, and, and I can speak clearly that uh, there can be an understanding of, of the message that you want people to know relative to what your purpose was uh, through your servant Moses on the mountain. And I believe it was your mountain, the mountain of God. And whether it was in a place called Horeb or a place called Sinai, uh, we can debate that. But you know, we know it was your mountain that you called Moses up to. So we thank you uh, for your word that we can continue to study and grow in, in our understanding of it and uh, inspire us to uh, seek that kind of relationship with you that you called Moses to have, and, and particularly your, your chosen people, Israel, as well. And we know as humans we all fail, but we, you've, you've sent your son, and so we are called now as the bride of Christ, as the body of Christ, to, to be in Christ, uh, and through the power of the Holy Spirit we can do that. And so we thank you for the relationship that we have with your son Jesus. So be with us through our teaching in this time of fellowship together in our day uh, that we can we can celebrate, celebrate, give you praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I'm going to, by way of review, <clears throat> just to kind of catch up before I start covering the charts I've uh, put here, um, is... Um, I think it's really important to understand every part of chapter 19 of Exodus. And this is the journey that God had Moses take his people on to bring them out of Egypt, um, experiencing the Passover, the, the tenth of the ten plagues of Egypt, and then the Passover, the saving of the firstborn came out of that. And then you have the Red Sea crossing, you have the uh, provision for water and food in the wilderness, um, and you had uh, the other, other things that, uh, that you, you did for them on the journey to the mount. You, um, you also saved them from the, an enemy called the Amalekites on that journey. Some people have perhaps referred to you guiding them, saving them through the waters of the Red Sea. Even with their complaints, you provided food for them and water for them. And, and so you have this picture, if you will, that we're trying to paint here, of your courtship with Israel, your chosen people, before you, prepare, you were preparing them at the mountain to receive your offer your offer to them if they would just be obedient to you of a relationship that's a wife, a wife to Yahweh, to you, to the Father. And so that's what we want to look at as we go through chapter 19 and on. Uh, so where I'm at on the outline is on page two, and it's that, it's that uh, topic, the law is given. And this only goes through 19 here. We'll continue on. I'll talk about it a little bit this morning. And then hopefully next week I'll have an, an outline that will take us on past <clears throat> chapter 19 into chapter 20 and through, through Exodus as much, as much as I can get done. So let me read once again. I read this last week, but it's a good thing to repeat it and to concentrate on what God has had Moses write in, in his word. In the third month after the Israelites left Egypt, on the very day they came to the desert of Sinai. After they set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai and the Israelites camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God. That's his first trip up to God on the mountain. And the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the house of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. 
You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. And then I want to emphasize verse 5 again. It's so important to understand relative to the difference between the Abrahamic covenant that we've been talking about for several weeks with the, with the promise, uh, the promises of, uh, given to Abraham by God. And so, Karen, do you want to give them a copy? Um, so, um, and so I want to point this verse out in Exodus chapter 19, verse, verse 5, of what's the difference between this covenant that God is making with Moses on what traditionally we call Mount Sinai, or the mountain of God, to, uh, to the Abrahamic covenant. So as I read verse 5 of chapter 19, uh, notice some important words in here. <clears throat> Because the Lord is saying this to Moses. Now if, and that word in English we can understand pretty, it's a, it's a conditional. If you, if you say if on something, it means it's conditional on something else. And so if you obey me fully, that isn't partly, that's fully. Obey everything I tell you, everything I want you to do. So if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, the covenant, you know, obviously initially made the Abrahamic covenant with Abraham, but now he's making a covenant through Moses to his own people and creating, and that's what I'm teaching on here this morning, a special relationship with God's chosen people on that mountain. But it's dependent on something that they are to do. So now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. That's a special blessing. That's a personal blessing. That's a personal relationship. Although the whole world is mine, it's under his hand, under his guidance, under his creation. You will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That's what he desired of his chosen people, Israel. And so we'll get to hopefully some of this uh, today. If not, I'll have to finish it next week. But on this chart, this board, I've got the two different pictures in Scripture. And much of the church today has tried to merge those. The relationship of the Father, Yahweh, to Israel, the chosen people that God is establishing here on Mount Sinai, traditionally we call it. And the New Testament, in the age of grace, in the age of, uh, uh, of uh, great grace, in the age of, uh, of the church, we have the relationship of the bride, the bride or the body of Christ, many names we give to ourselves as a unit, the church, the believers in Christ <clears throat> through the drawing of the Holy Spirit. When we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we become uh, and maintained by the power of the Holy Spirit, the bride of Christ. And so the, the verses I have here on the board, and if you want to take a picture later, if you have a camera or whatever, you can take pictures of my charts. It may help you to study on your own um, or, or, or make notes. But it's a, it's, a, it's a real picture of the church, and we talk about it all the time, being the bride of Christ. And so we, we're engaged to Christ, I guess I would put it, because if, if we put our faith and trust in him, we know that the marriage will take place at a later time. We talk about Revelation 19, the marriage supper of the Lamb. And, and so the marriage will be in heaven. And that will be after we, we are out of these bodies and we're transformed into new bodies and the wedding will take place. We'll be 
connected through Christ eternally in a very personal and intimate way. And, um, and so the church is to be the bride of Christ. Israel remains uh, the wife of Yahweh. And that's a relationship. Yes, we can say that it was broken. Uh, they were unfaithful. And we, saw, we see it on the Mount Sinai experience that before Moses even came down the mountain after 40 days, they were falling into idol worship. They started worshiping the, the golden calf. But God still didn't give up on them. You know, he, he still calls them back, and he still does to this day. He wants them to be his wife. He has not divorced them. You know, we have some images that uh, the northern tribes of Israel may have received a divorce decree, but God will bring all that back together in the, in the conclusion of things. And so... Uh, the chosen people will be and be reunited as the as the wife of Yahweh. So that's the difference in picture. So, so the point I'm making here in chapter 19, this is an if statement. If they do these things. And, and God makes it clear. Jesus makes it even more clear in the New Testament. What does, what does God require? To love him. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And so, in order to express that kind of love in a marriage relationship, um, there must be trust and there must be obe obedience to one another. And so, God is faithful always, trust, trusting always, trustworthy always. But humans are not. And so we know there's broken relationships that can occur. But God promised them to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation if they will just obey him. And as I read on here, this is an important, uh, these are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So in verse 7 of chapter 19, Moses went back and summoned the elders. So he went, went from the presence of God back down to talk to the elders of the people and set before them all the words the Lord had commanded him to speak. And then verse 8. The people all, it says all, all responded together, we will do everything the Lord has said. You can almost sense uh, the wedding vow. The wedding vow being being made here. We will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought the answer back to the Lord. He went back to the Lord, up to the Lord, and gave the Lord the answer from the people. And then the Lord went on in verse 9. The Lord said to Moses, I'm going to come to you in a dense cloud. So I'm going to start talking about these pictures that are being painted and what God is doing on the mountain. So I'm going to go around here just a little bit to start this. This chart here, I've got the Hebrew words, the Hebrew pictures that are in a Hebrew wedding, a Hebrew wedding ceremony. If you've ever had the chance to witness a Hebrew type wedding ceremony, you'll see a lot of ritual. A lot of ritual goes on. You have the first thing that's usually noticeable that there's a, a covering a covering or tent-like thing over the parties, and particularly the bride. And it's called a hoopah. The hoopah is the Hebrew word for it, and it is often defined as a canopy, a chamber, a closet. There's a couple verses in the Old Testament, Psalm 19.5 uh, calls it a chamber, and refers to a bride and a bridegroom. And Joel 2.16 uh, refers to it as a closet. And so, with, and so in preparing for the wedding ceremony, uh, they cover them, they're being covered uh, with a hoopah. And so the picture here in God's word you know, talks about the cloud, the dense cloud. And so we know at Mount Sinai there was a 
dense cloud and it remained over that mountain all the time that Moses was up there. And so uh, I'm going to come to you in a dense cloud. This is still future to this point in time he's talking to Moses. But now he's going to tell them, get the people ready. Get the people ready. So that the people will hear me speaking with you and will always put their trust in you. Then Moses told the Lord what the people had said. Because Moses had gone down. And up in verse 8, we see what they said. We'll do anything. We'll, we will do everything the Lord has said. That's a pretty strong promise. Because I think all of us know that... <laughs> We don't keep it perfectly. But they were so intent on it that they believed they could. And so, so Moses uh, went up and told the Lord. And so then in verse 10, the Lord says to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. For two days. Consecrate them. Make them holy. Make them clean. And so what does he do to do that? Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day because on that day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai or the mountain in Sinai in the sight of all people. So the second word I have here in the Hebrew, and of course it's part of the preparation for the, for the wedding, uh, is the mikvah. They also use the mikvah for other purposes in Israel, in the, in the Hebrew culture, Jewish culture, uh, for washing. Uh, when they went into the temple, back in the days the temple stood, they would often wash themselves and make themselves clean before they entered God's holy place. And so the mikvah is a washing. And it <clears throat> can be defined in general as a collection of water but it's usually a bath type of arrangement. You, you dunk yourself, cleanse yourself. Those of you that were, were baptized last, last week, it's, it's kind of that, that kind of picture. You're, you're in, going into the water, you die to yourself, and you're brought back to, in Christ, and you're confessing your faith. So, so the mikvah is that cleansing before uh, before the actual ceremony would, would begin. So God was telling them to prepare themselves so that when you come back up to the mountain, <clears throat> they, are, they are in the right, uh, right state. Um, and then verse 12, put limits for the people around the mountain and tell them, important instruction, be careful that you do not go up the mountain or touch the foot of it. And there's a warning here. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. It's that holy. It's absolutely holy. God makes it holy. And so if you touch, it's like touching or, or, or in the presence of God himself, which uh, brings death. <clears throat> and then verse 13, he shall surely be stoned or shot with arrows. Not a hand is to be laid on him, whether man or animal. <clears throat> he shall not be permitted to live. And then we talked a little bit about this last week. The next line, and that's kind of where we ended it, our discussion last week. Only when the ram's horn, the shofar, the shofar sounds a long blast, may they go up to the mountain. I don't think I shared this last week. But in the Hebrew tradition, particularly with, with uh, this account, they... Uh, they believed that the ram's horn, the shofar, came from one of the horns of the, of the ram that was provided by God when Abraham was to sacrifice his son Isaac. And so there's also then the thinking in the, in the Hebrew, the Jewish mindset, there's two horns on the ram. So there's a horn that was blown back here on Mount Sinai, when will the next horn be blown? And so we can, we can almost <laughs> to tell them because, you know, First Thessalonians, Paul wrote about it, that there will be a horn that will sound, and it's a shofar. And so the, the preparation for the church, for the bride of Christ to be caught up to the bridal chamber 
in heaven will be the sounding of a ram's horn too. So, so this sounding of the ram's horn has a very ceremonial uh, aspect to it. And let's go on with verse 14. This is where I, I stopped reading last week, but let's go on. After Moses had gone down the mountain, <clears throat> this is after his second time going up the mountain and, and coming back down now, um, down the mountain, he consecrated them and they washed their clothes. So part, part of the, the nik, mikvah thinking. Then he said to the people, Prepare yourselves for the third day, and this was one of the requirements in the preparation process, abstain from sexual relations. And so that's, that's also part of the purity. The bride is to be a pure bride. Uh, and so, so that, in God's eyes, uh, and, so, and so they were preparing uh, for the third day for the third day when God would present himself on the mountain and call Moses up again. On the morning of the third day, look at what the actions in the, in the heavens are. There was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain. Again, this picture of the cloud. Um, the hoopah, uh, which is, is still, you know, is, remains as part of the, of the wedding ceremony. <clears throat> Everyone, uh, say, over the mountain in a very loud trumpet blast. I always ask, just, I don't have an answer, a definite answer, but I always ask, who blew the trumpet? Doesn't say, doesn't tell us, but we can speculate, we choose to, we can't know for sure. Some might say, well, Gabriel's the one that blows the trumpet, we we're always have heard and learned. Well, it could be. Gabriel could, could be there uh, with God, you know, in the background. Or is it more likely that it may have been God himself that blew the trumpet? You know, how, how important this is. So, anyway, that, that's, a, that's a question left unanswered, but I always kind of ask it anyway. Then, when the trumpet blew, everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace. The whole mountain trembled violently, and the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. I think I mentioned last week, if you if you've heard somebody that can really blow the shofar really well, they can do it with a wailing sound. It just woo, woo, woo you know, and, and they can, you know, I have a shofar, but I can't, I can't do it like that. Can you, Joel can? Yeah. Maybe I'll bring my shofar and you can <laughs> give us a demonstration. <laughs> so anyway, we'll, we'll keep that in mind. Um, so, uh, then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot, the foot of the mountain. Remember, they were at the bottom, at the foot of the mountain. They could not touch the mountain, or they would die. Mount Sinai was covered with the smoke and so forth. The smoke billowed up. The trumpet grew louder and louder. Then Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. The Lord descended. Okay, now, now we get a little different picture. Where was the Lord before he descended? Well, in the heavenly realm. Um, but he descended to the top of the mount, Mount Sinai, the mountain of God, and called Moses to the top of the mountain. So here's God coming down to meet his representative of his chosen people, meet them in a, in a middle ground, but he still calls Moses up. And so here's the reference to Moses' third trip. As I said last week, here's an 80-year-old man. Must be in pretty good shape. <laughs> Climbing this pretty significant mountain, we believe. And so here he, he goes back up for the what we see as the third time, um, going to the top of the mountain. So Moses went up, and the Lord said to him, Go down and warn the people so they do not force their way through to see the Lord and many of them perish. 
Even the priests who approach the Lord must consecrate themselves or the Lord will break out against them. Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up uh, to Mount Sinai because you yourselves warned us. Put limits around the mountain and set it apart as holy. The Lord replied, go down and bring Aaron, his brother, up the priest, the high priest, Aaron up with you, but the priests and the people must not force their way through to come up to the Lord or he will break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and told them. Okay, the rest of this teaching I want to highlight and we'll probably continue on it next week, but um, because we have the hoopah, the, the covering, the cloud covering, which represents in the Hebrew wedding the, the covering that they cover, the bride and groom, uh, the mikvah being washed, made, made clean, uh, being a pure bride, <clears throat> and and now we go to the third the third item on the on the on the chart here. And it's called the ketubah. The ketubah in Hebrew just means simply a contract or vow. And so I'm not going to get into it fully this morning, the details of it, but you go to chapter 20, and I'll hopefully have a handout for that next week. And then we'll go on to uh, the later verses in chapter 24 and chapter 31. <clears throat> but the marriage contract itself, and this is where... I think we have always had, in general, in the church, the wrong idea about what the Ten Commandments are all about. And when you can understand it from a point of God wanting to be the husband and wanting Israel to be his wife, then you have this marriage relationship. Um, and so the ketubah in the marriage relationship is a marriage contract. Now, many of us <clears throat> don't necessarily do, a, do a, a written contract. I know some people are going more to that today because marriages don't last. We know in, in our country, 50% of the marriages break up. And But the marriage contract is, is part of that. Marriage contract or covenant. And literally the Ten Commandments, and that's why I want to briefly talk about the Ten Commandments, but we'll talk about them in more detail next week. I'll have a little bit more time with them. Um, but in general, I just want you to get the picture. As, as you read the Ten Commandments from chapter 20, um, we, we, you know, we talked about four of them are generally um, about the relationship with God and the other six are about relationship with one another. And so this is this is one way that you could you could put what they're really all about. What the Ten Commandments are really what God intended them to be. Because God wrote the Ten Commandments with his finger. Wrote wrote on the stone with his finger. And so he's saying to his people, I love you. It's a love contract. I love you. You will be my treasured possession. You will be my royal priesthood. But you must obey. And obedience is, is the response necessary. Um, and, so, um, and so when you just in general talk about the Ten Commandments, I'm going to put it in common, common phrases. God's requirement is you have no other lovers. No other lovers, not even statues or pictures. I give you my name. Use it well, bride. Find time for me to love me and know me. We'll call it the Sabbath. And then the bride's response, <clears throat> that's the other six. Get along, be united to one another. Don't kill each other. Don't take each other's husbands or wives. Don't steal, don't bear false witness. Honor your parents, don't envy. 
So if you can look at it in terms of the love relationship, if you really love me, you'll keep my commandments. And so that's the ketubah, the ketubah in the Hebrew wedding. And so we have that. And I want to give you one other picture or a couple other pictures as I have time here before we have to close. Uh, and I want you to turn, if you have your Bibles, because I want you to see this for yourself. Chapter 31, if you move forward to chapter 31, when <coughs> Moses has received the Ten Commandments, and this is, let's see, 31, verse 12. I want to start with verse 12. And I'm going to read through verse 18, 12 to 18 total, but I want to concentrate on part of this. So this is kind of, kind of just fits in with before Moses comes down the mountain and he discovers the golden calf. So we know what happens after the 40 days he's been up there. Um, but this is his but God's description for Moses of what the Sabbath is all about. And we can talk about the meaning of the Sabbath, but I think if you really look at what God's word, God's own word says, we should have a clear picture of who the Sabbath is for. And the Sabbath is literally the seventh day of the week, which the Jewish people celebrate on, from Friday night to Saturday night. Of course, we have Seventh-day Adventists in the Christian world that, that also say that Sabbath is the right day to, to worship, and that would be Old Testament. But I want you to understand this reading. Then the Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, You must observe my Sabbaths. This will be a sign. And that word sign is oath in Hebrew. And I think it's the same picture as given each other the rings in a marriage, marriage ceremony. So the sign of that for them, between them, between God and the Hebrew people, between me and you for the generations to come, so you may know that I am the Lord who makes you holy. Totally dependent upon the Lord, totally trusting in the Lord. Verse 14, observe the Sabbath. That's important because it is holy to you. Anyone who desecrates it must be put to death. That's pretty strong. Whoever does any work on that day must be cut off from his people. For six days work is to be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day must be put to death. And then verse 16, and this is the critical 16 and 17. The Israelites, a distinct group of people, the Israelites are to observe the Sabbath. The Sabbath is for Israel, for the Israelites. Celebrating it for the generations to come as a lasting covenant, forever covenant, in fact it'll say right here, it will be a sign. It will be a sign between me, Yahweh, the Father, and the Israelites, Forever. Forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he abstained from the work and rested. And then verse 18, just to finish it. When the Lord finished speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him the two tablets of testimony and the tablets of stone inscribed by the finger of God. God personally wrote it. Now we know as we read on, and we'll cover this in future lessons, that when Moses came down the mountain, he saw what they were doing, worshiping the golden calf, and Moses destroyed those first tablets. So he had to make the journey up again, <laughs> and had to, had to fast for 40 days and 40 nights the second time, and, and get the new, new set of tablets of stone. And we believe the actual tablets of stone you can debate this if you want to, were most likely, I believe, written on both sides of the tablet. Oftentimes we see them pictured as 
you have the one set of commandments on one and the other set of commandments on the other. I believe each tablet of stone wasn't partially of the commandments. It's two part, two tablets, exactly the same thing. It's like they do making a contract. Both parties to the agreement have to get a copy. But what God said with the tablets of stone, you keep both of them and you carry them around in your Ark of the Covenant, which, which we'll get to when we talk about what happens up in the mount even more with the tabernacle, with the ark, the, the things in the ark. So I believe God wrote them personally and, and, he, and Moses had to go back and get a second copy because he broke the first to pieces when he was so angry with his people. But those tablets of stone uh, were written by God himself. And so, so I think that's important to understand. But the Sabbath, uh, resting from work, uh, worshiping, all the things that we relate to traditionally being called the Sabbath, but the Sabbath is, is truly the seventh day of the week. That's what, what it means. And so that's, to, by uh, not, you know, general knowledge, that's uh, the Friday-Saturday period of time. It's the, when the it, you know, people, Hebrew people, the Jewish people, continue to worship. And so this was given to them as a, I call it a sign, but I would say in the wedding picture, it's the ring. So if you wear the ring, if you observe, if you practice it, then that honors God who the relationship is with. Now we know they broke, broke those things. Uh, and so it, um, it, you know, it, it was not kept. And so that's why God had to punish the Israelites, why he had to send them into exile uh, the various times and the various proceedings. So, and so that's where sometimes this, the church, I believe, gets a little bit arrogant. I'm going to finish with this because by and large, a lot of the uh, church, the Roman Catholic, started with the Roman Catholic Church, moved on to some of the other denominations that basically teach and practice replacement theology. And replacement theology, I believe, is one of the worst things that's been inserted into the church because it says that, that the church has replaced Israel for all of God's covenants and all of God's plans. And when you see in your own, wor in your own reading of his word, that the Sabbath was given to the Israelites forever. <laughs> how, do you, how do you just, you know, exclude that? And the many other things too. So anyway, we'll, we'll stop there. We'll pick up a little bit on this. I'm not gonna get into a lot of depth uh, on the rest of it. We'll move into the actual 10 commandments of how they're written. Uh, we'll get into the other things that were given to Moses on Mount Sinai. Uh, just in broad strokes, I'm not going to get into detail. Like, for example, I've done a tabernacle study. Those have been through my tabernacle study that, that done the details. It is on our, on our website if you want to hear. It's only audio. It's not, it's not visual. But when I did it for the ladies a few years ago, we did record it. It was in about five lessons, I think five or six lessons, of about 45 to an hour, so forth. And so you can access that on our, on our website, redeeminggracebc.org, and uh, go down to the media and drop down to Tabernacle, and you can get my teaching on that. Because uh, I'm not going to go into that kind of depth here, because that, that takes uh, <laughs> weeks <laughs> to to even go through. But I have a model model that I set up and that kind of thing. So anyway, let's let's close. It's time to close and prepare ourselves for our time of worship. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time you've given us. Uh, thank you for uh, the Holy Spirit that you have given us to to be our teacher and our guide. Continue to provide illumination to us in your word by the Holy Spirit, guiding us to the things that you want us to see 
in, in the times we're in, in, in uh, a greater understanding of, of the original meaning in your word. Help us to take it seriously and not just make it up as we go. So I thank you for the totality of your word, and I thank you particularly for this part of it. And I thank you for this picture that we can uh, maybe better see what your intention was by giving the law. The giving of the law was not for, uh, to prohibit, you know, only to prohibit, but to express your love for your people. And so we, we thank you for that and help us to understand it better and help us to respond accordingly as well in our relationship with you and particularly with your son, Jesus Christ, who saved us from our sins by dying on the cross and, and we, so that our relationship with one another can be more uh, like what you want us to be in dealing with each other. So we thank you for for this time we've had here and we thank you now ahead of time for our time of worship. We pray as we prepare for our time of worship and the people that may come into this place. We just pray that if there's people that may come into this place that are visitors or, or haven't been here before, I just pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will move and, and the, what they see in this place is something that uh, is meaningful to them and, and we can continue to, to be encourage them in their walk of faith too for anybody new but for all the people that have regularly come we just ask for a blessing on them as well that the time of fellowship the time of the prayers the prayers and the word and raymond's message all the parts of our worship service the music uh, can be a blessing to you as well lord and we we pray ahead of time for our fellowship meal as well we thank you for this time that we can gather and and that uh, that you bless that time for us as well. So I thank you ahead of time for what you're going to do in this day for each one, each one of us. Help us to be mindful, always looking at what you're calling us to do and encouraging us to do and who you're putting in our path. And help us not to miss, miss the opportunities that are there. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.